Hi, this is Dave Birmingham, Senior Technical Evangelist with Cyrus Technology and Microsoft Cluster MVP. Today I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of the Cyrus Protection Suite for SQL Server. What you see in front of you is the GUI that we will use to configure protection of your SQL Server to give you high availability and disaster recovery configurations. You can see we're connected to two servers, one called primary, one called secondary. We're going to walk through the, the process to create a failover cluster between primary and secondary server. The first thing we want to do is create communication paths. These are the heartbeats that will help detect when there's a failure of the entire server. We click here and we'll launch the wizard to create a communication path. We'll have to choose the local server first and then the remote server. The type of communication heartbeat that we want to use, TCP is the standard heartbeat, and we'll stick with that. Heartbeat interval determines how often do I send a heartbeat. Six seconds is the default, we'll leave that. And then the maximum heartbeats determines how many heartbeats I can miss before we determine that a failure has occurred. The default is five seconds. So essentially, after 30 seconds, we will determine that a failure has occurred. We'll choose the local IP addresses we want to use for the heartbeat. And complete the wizard. Choosing the remote IP addresses on the secondary server. Now that the heartbeats or communication paths have been established, next we're going to create our resource hierarchy. The first thing we want to do is create an IP resource. This is the IP address that my application servers will communicate with. So we'll choose the primary server and the secondary server and click next. And the application we want to protect is the IP address. So we're going to choose an IP address that is on a public network that is not currently in use. So we will go with a 10.160.150.100 address. The subnet mask. And the IP resource tag is what we see in the GUI. We'll leave that as is. And we're going to put that on the public network. Local recovery. If uh, we choose to, we could fail over to a hot standby NIC. But in this case, we will choose no for local recovery. I'll move this to the side so we can see what's going on behind the scenes. We see that the IP address came online and is uh, currently associated with the primary server. Next, we will extend that resource to the secondary server. So we'll click Next. And Next once again. The IP address is going to, uh, the subnet mask is going to remain the same. The network we want to use is the public network. Target restore mode, we will enable this. This is useful when you're failing across subnets that uh, are in different subnets. Target local recovery, again, we'll leave this set to no as we do not have a hot standby NIC. And 
we'll click extend. And finish. So we have the IP resource created. Next, we're going to create the SQL Server resource and the volume resource all in the same operation. So if we click on here, we can create a resource hierarchy. Again, we choose the primary and the backup server. The application that we want to protect is Microsoft SQL Server. The instance is the primary. The name is looking for here is the SA account for SQL Server on primary. So we'll choose SA and the password for the SA account. So you see that it queried the instance of SQL Server are already installed on this particular server and we see that the uh, the current databases are all located on the eDrive. If they weren't, we would find that that the solution could relocate the databases to the replicated volumes for us. But in our case, we already have all the volumes on the eDrive. So we'll click continue. Here are the optional services we could protect. In our case, we will choose none of the optional services and click next. Here's the IP we previously created. We'll use that as part of our hierarchy. We do not have a name pipe alias. And the resource name we'll leave as the default. Once again, I'll move this to the side. We can see that the SQL Server resource has been created on the primary server. And the next step is to extend it to the secondary server. So we'll go ahead and click Next. And it's running some extendability checks for the resources we created. So now it's going to want to, to extend the, um, the volume E to the secondary server. And we'll go ahead and create a mirror. It's asking us for the endpoints of the mirrors. We will choose the private network for the replication traffic. We have a choice of asynchronous or synchronous mirroring for local area networks. Synchronous mirroring is the right choice. And we'll go ahead and create the mirror. And click next. And we will go ahead and extend the resource to the secondary server. And when we click finish here, we will have a fully configured functioning SIOS, uh, SIOS protection suite for SQL Server configuration. We have SQL, the IP, and the volume all running on the primary server and all being backed up by the secondary server.